ahead and take out our Bibles. We're going to need them this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. It is a light unto our path. It is a mirror that shows us who we are. It's a revelation that shows us who you are. So we pray, oh God, this would not simply be the time of another church service. But we come with an expectation of an encounter with you. We come with an anticipation that you would transform our hearts. Cause these words to burst forth from their ink cage, O oh God, and live and dance in us. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would give us the strength to not simply be hearers of the word only, but doers also. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If only we would have died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt, where there we sat by the flesh pots and ate our bread. What is freedom? What does it look like? Would we know it if we saw it? You know, in the West, and particularly in the United States of America, we have this highly developed concept of what freedom is. Uh, this self-autonomy, this self-dependency, uh, this rugged individualist, uh, individualism that we can kind of pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and succeed and pursue the American dream. We talk about freedom of speech, freedom of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, freedom of religion. But I wonder if what we understand to be freedom in our culture is actually God's design for what freedom is supposed to be. And I think in our text this morning, in the book of Exodus, in the 16th chapter, uh, God really shows us the kind of freedom that he has in mind for his people. As the whole congregation sets out from Elam, that place that uh, is a paradise where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. Remember last week that the problem in the community was that there was a thirst. The people were thirsty and they're in this new environment where there's no water. And so they begin to complain and grumble because there's a real need. But then at Mara, God turns the bitter water sweet and God leads the people to this Elam situation where it's all the water they can drink, 12 springs for the 12 tribes. And the, the people fill their uh, canteens and their buckets and their jars, filled with all the water they can carry, and then they set off from that place, and they come into the wilderness of sin. Now it's interesting that the wilderness that they're wandering around in is called sin. And it doesn't mean the, the word sin, as we understand it, the theological concept of sin. The place where they, they are, literally in the Hebrew, the word is the wilderness of sin. Coincidence? I don't know. I think that uh, coincidences are micro miracles from God. Can I get an amen? Yeah. But here's a people, they're wandering around, they're in transition, and they're in the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. So really to understand what's happening in the passage, we have to understand that this is a people in transition. This is a people who are on a journey, and they're now in the space between these two destinations, Elam and Sinai. The ultimate goal, the vision, the dream, uh, is a promised land. A land that's spiritually and metaphorically flowing with milk and honey. Uh, a land that's been promised to their ancestors. But along this journey, there's an important stop they're going to make at Sinai. Where God is going to actually uh, manifest His glory and give the people the covenant to show them the kind of people that they're supposed to be. And so they're on this journey between Elam and Sinai and on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. So they're about a month and a half out in this journey. A month and a half after they've seen God send uh, plagues of locusts and Niles turn to blood and split seas. They are wandering in this wilderness, this new environment that's totally unfamiliar to them. And the Israelites say, if only we die by the hand of the Lord of Egypt... For it was there we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. Now maybe you're wondering what a flesh pot is. It, it sounds kind of crude. But it's simply just a pot where people would cook their meats. And Egypt was a place of extravagance. It was a place where there was meat. And any good pharaoh knows if you want your slaves to provide. Remember that Egypt is a, a nation that's formed on the backs of slaves. If you want your slaves to, to thrive and do their work well, then you need to feed them. And so Egypt was an extravagant place where there was meat and there was bread. And so the people are reflecting and recollecting back on the good stuff of Egypt. 
For you have brought us into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Have you ever been hungry? You know, hunger is a real need. It's a physiological need. We can't really downplay the fact that these people have a reason to complain. They have a reason to grumble because they have a real need and it's hunger. God's designed us physiologically to consume food. And we Methodists do that very well. Can I get an amen? <laughs> God has made us people that, that eat food. We need to eat to nurture our bodies in order to survive. And so there's this very real need that the people have, uh, that there's this hunger. I'll tell you what, when I was laid up in a hospital for 30 days on, and on a liquid diet for, the, for a lot of that, um, and uh, not able to eat anything, just intravenous and, and fluids, um, I began to know this hunger that I'd never known before. And I began to have these kind of dreams about cheeseburgers and pizza and chicken wings. And even though the nurse and the doctor said, you can't eat anything, it could hurt you, it could seriously damage what you got going on. I was telling Jill, Jill, please, just, just smuggle me in a cheeseburger. I don't care, fruit, something, right, a banana. Just, just give me something. Because hunger is a real thing. And if you've ever been hungry, you know that hunger can change your entire mindset and cause you to get cranky and grumpy and, and disgruntled. Can I get an amen? Yeah. And so that's what these people are experiencing. They're experiencing this hunger. But at, at the same time, you have to really ask yourself, is this a food crisis or a faith crisis? I mean, in light of what God has already done, sending locusts and uh, diseased livestock and split seas and turning bitter water sweet, I mean, you really got to wonder, is this a faith crisis or a food crisis? Because the God who can do all those things can certainly provide for His people. So they, they know this hunger that they've never known before, and they're reflecting back on Egypt, and the grumbling of their stomachs is so loud and so powerful that they forget the voices of their taskmasters. They forget the sounds of their whips and chains. They forget the cries of their children being thrown into the Nile. And all they can remember is the flesh pots and the bread of the good old days. And so their memory is actually skewed of what Egypt does. You can say that maybe these people need to get their head out of their past. Because there are people who are literally walking backwards into their future, looking back to Egypt. And the truth is, although they're liberated physically, in their minds, they're still slaves. And you have to really ask yourself, is it easier for God to liberate someone physically or mentally? Maybe it's harder for God to remove the people from Egypt than it is for God to remove the Egypt from the people. Because these are people who are still living in slavery in their minds. They're reflecting back and looking back at Egypt. And what's happening is that God is weaning these people from Pharaoh and Egypt dependency to God dependency. He's learning, uh, teaching these people to learn to walk with Him and to count and to trust on Him. And so the Lord says to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven. He's the God who can make it rain. Can I get an amen? amen. He's the God who can make it rain bread. <coughs> and so they, these uh, 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 people are grumbling and complaining. And God says, I'm going to rain this bread down from heaven. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough just for that day. Just for today, I'm going to give you enough. And in that way, I'm going to test them. Now, the word test can mean literally to test, to see if someone's approved. But it can also be understood as this process of disciplining of shaping someone, testing them uh, to forge them and, and to the people that they're supposed to be. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna test them on whether they're gonna follow my instruction or not. And so what's the instruction of God? We saw it last week. That you will listen to my voice, that you will walk with me, that you will walk in my way, and that you will trust me. And so the Lord uh, is testing in this, them in this. He says that on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it'll be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Why? Because He's a God of Sabbath. He's a God who commands that we work six days and we rest on the Sabbath. And so Moses and Aaron say to the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who redeemed you from Egypt. 
And there's that word again that we've seen many times throughout Exodus, the word know, yada in the Hebrew, to know. God knows the suffering of his people. God knows his people in this intimate way. The people don't know God. They've forgotten him after 430 years of slavery. Uh, Pharaoh doesn't know God. Moses doesn't know God. Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should know him? Moses says, who are you? What is your name? He said, the most revolutionary aspect of Exodus, ladies and gentlemen, is not the locusts and the seas and the uh, Nile and the, the, the seas parted. The most revolutionary thing about the book of Exodus is a God who makes himself known to his creation. Can I get an amen? amen. God is doing all this for a very specific purpose. And in the morning, you're going to see the glory of the Lord because he's heard you're complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? Because Moses and Aaron have emerged as the leaders of the community or the ones that God is using to guide this journey. They automatically become the ones that have the bullseye. Up. And so Moses and Aaron come to this realization. What are you complaining against us for? You should take your com complaints to the man upstairs, right? Because there's nothing special about Moses and Aaron. We're just a bum on the bus like everybody else. We're just like you. We can't do anything uh, that, that God can do. Moses and Aaron can't make it rain bread from heaven. Moses and Aaron can't turn bitter water sweet. Only God can do that. And Moses and Aaron are coming to a terms with the fact that God does not intend his community to look like a power structure where there are humans in power over other humans. God's design for his community is that he be the living center of his community. Now, does God use leadership? Does God gift people for leadership? Absolutely. But what we're getting to is the fact that all of us are called to be Moses' and Aaron's. Can I get an amen? amen? That God has called us to be a priesthood of believers that reveal him to the world. So Moses and Aaron say, hey, what are you complaining against us for? There's nothing we can do. You should be talking to God about this. And then Moses says to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord. Because the truth is, if you're hungry and you're groaning and you're complaining, you're not near to the Lord. You're far away. And this whole thing is about worship. God says, Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they may come and worship me. Because the truth is, the people have been worshiping a lot of gods, but not the one true God. And so Moses says, draw near to the people, for he's heard your complaining. And then God manifests his glory, which appears in this cloud. The Shekinah glory of God, the presence of God, comes into the wilderness, and the people begin to worship. When the presence of God falls in the place, all you can do is worship. Can I get an amen? amen. And so there they are in the wilderness, in the situation where it's dry, there's no water, there's no food. But we see almost the reverse activity of what happens in Egypt. Here's a God that can send plagues of locusts and part uh, uh, seas and turn Nile into blood. But he's also a God that can turn bitter water sweet, rain quail from heaven, and send bread like dew. And so the people worship God. They draw close to God. And then God does something amazing. In the evening, quails come and cover the whole camp. In the evening, it's a quail party, y'all. Quails just start running from the sky. The, the, this, this desert kind of situation becomes a golden corral kind of situation. All the quail you can eat. Fried quail, boiled quail, cooked quail, however you want it. A quail chicken wing party. It looks like a lot like a Methodist potluck with all the quail you can eat, except God is the one who brings the good stuff. Can I get an amen? amen. It starts to rain quail meat from the, from the sky, and then in the morning they get up and they find this stuff on the ground and they say, Manu, manna, what is it? Which literally manna is this bread that they take and they eat it, and it's sweet, and, and they prepare it. And so God has again supernaturally met their need with bread and with uh, meat, and so the people have their fill, but God puts some restrictions on this. He says, take what you need just for today. Don't try to store back or hold back. Just live in this dependence, this reliance, by faith and trust in me. Because I'm going to send the same thing I sent today tomorrow. Now what do the people do? They don't listen, right? They try to store up. Hey, this stuff's good. This manna stuff. I'm going to go ahead and keep some back for tomorrow. And so they store it up. And then that, that stuff turns into maggots. It's no good. They can't eat it. 
And so what we see is God trying to wean them on to this reliance on God, to wean them away from fair dependency and on to God dependency. And so he said, but all you need is just for today. You don't need to store up for tomorrow because I'm going to be the God who meets your need tomorrow too. And then uh, he says, but don't collect on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day is holy. So if you collect enough on that sixth day, there'll be enough for the Sabbath too. And ultimately, folks, what this is is not a food crisis, it's a faith crisis. It's a people who are living in fear. It's a people who've been in bondage so long that although their bodies are free, their minds are still enslaved. And so they are looking back to Egypt and they are reflecting on the good stuff and forgetting that slavery. And because time in the wilderness is hard sometimes. It's hard to trust and rely upon God on a daily basis. And so that's why we, we, we see in the church community things like not tithing. That's a spiritual sickness. That's a person who lives in the fear that there's not going to be enough. Or there's other things I'd rather uh, spend my money on. It's not understanding the concept of stewardship and that God is the source of everything that we have and that He's going to provide for us just like He always has. Can I get an amen? amen? God says take just what you need for today because I'm going to provide. He gives us this design for living where He's teaching the people to live in a place of powerlessness and dependency but believing and trusting and having faith in Him that He's going to walk with them. And ultimately, God is redeeming not only their bodies and their hearts, but their minds. Because the truth is, God doesn't liberate His people from Egypt so they can run willy-nilly throughout the world and do whatever they want to do. God liberates His people so that they will reflect His glory. They have a mission in the world to make Him known. And so the design for living and living in faithful dependency and trust upon God is so that they will be like God. That they will reflect their Creator. That those six days they'll work, that seventh they'll rest because that's what God does. That they'll have faith and trust in this God who's the center of the community, who's going to never leave them nor forsake them, but will walk with them throughout the wilderness. You know, sometimes we can be totally physically free, but bound up and slain in our lives. I mean, when you look at phenomenons like alcoholism and drug addiction and all the kind of hurts, habits, and hiccups that we can get in, overeating and overspending and all those things that we do, you know, you can be totally free in your body but be a slave in your mind. That, that you can't control that impulse. And we all have some, some issues. Can I get an amen? Is anybody perfect here today? We all have things that we wrestle with, that we struggle with. But God says, yield those things to me, and I'm going to show you a freedom like you've never known before. I'm going to show you a freedom that if you'll live in faith and trust and dependency on me, you won't have to worry about what you're going to eat, right? And Jesus ultimately uh, takes this up in his ministry and lives it out. Jesus, who lives on this earth um, in total dependency upon his heavenly Father, doesn't have a, a house or a donkey or, or anything, just the, the cloak on his back and the staff and his disciples and they're walking around on this journey. And Jesus says to his disciples, live your lives one day at a time. Don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Look at the lilies of the field. They don't labor or spin, but not even Solomon in all his glory was clothed like one of these. Look at the sparrows in the sky. They don't store or reap, but yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And you are worth more than many sparrows, little flock. You of little faith. Jesus, who has this encounter with thousands of people who were hungry, and he tells his disciples, you feed them. And they say, Lord, we don't have any food. And he says, take that little boy's lunch. Have him sit down. There'll be enough. See, we live like slaves in our lives when we don't realize that there's always enough in God's economy. It's never a food crisis, it's always a faith crisis, because we serve a God who can rain bread from heaven. Jesus who says, by the way, you can't serve two masters. You'll either hate the one and love the other or not. And the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, freedom is not about being self-autonomous, self-reliant, and self-dependent. That's the antithesis of God's design of freedom. True freedom is living in a relationship with our Creator and trusting in Him, having faith in him, in him, and living with Him one day at a time that He will lovingly meet our needs 
that He will be with us no matter what, even in the wilderness of sin. And even when we kick and scream and fight all along the way, He'll be a God who will be with us. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so maybe we as the church should hear this word. Maybe we should get our head out of our past. Maybe we should know that God has done great and glorious things in our history, and that should be the foundation of who we are. But God's the God of now. He has a vision and a future for us, but He's the God who right now wants to redeem you. He's the God who right now wants to liberate you from your illness and your mental bondage. He's the God who right now wants you to know freedom and love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. He's the God of the eternal now. Amen. And if we learn that, hey, the past, we can't do anything about it. We can't change it. And the future might not ever come. But this day, God is with us. That this day, this God wants to lovingly meet our needs. And all we really have is now. And maybe if we would understand that and recover that, we would be able to live in a state of real freedom and peace and love and joy. Jesus gathers with his disciples and says, I am the bread of heaven. You know, when Moses asked God, who are you? And God says, I am that I am. This unfolding revelatory process continues in Jesus Christ, who says, I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the good shepherd. I am the living water, and I am the bread of heaven. That if you're hungry, because you know physical hunger is bad, but spiritual hunger is even worse. When you're hungry for God, when you're hungry and you've you got money and you've got food and you've got everything that America tells us we should have, but inside you're still hungry. Because the truth is that void, that hole that's in our soul, the only thing that will ever fill that void is a relationship with our God. Amen. And if we would learn that, then we would know true freedom. If we would value the things that God has given us, family and friends and His presence and the great things that we have, every moment is such a beautiful moment and every day is a precious gift. And if we would understand that, we would understand what Jesus meant. I am the bread of heaven. If you eat of this bread, you will never hunger again. Jesus, who is the bread of heaven, gathers with his disciples around a table and says, this body, this bread, this is my body that's broken for you. 